the big seed companies will make this invention. But the farmer doesn't. Every year he makes a selection. Every year he's able to sell that crop. There's no difference for the farmer between the inventive step and the selling step. So the, the big seed companies say, say, great, we can make our profit. The farmers say, that's terrible. You're allowed to make a profit, and we're not allowed to make a profit out of our own varieties. And the farmer organizations get really upset about this. The developing countries also get really upset about this. They see it that they have these old varieties, which the big companies from the rich countries are coming in to, to steal. So all this uh, invention, the profit from invention, is being made by the rich countries at the expense of the poor. So you get this permanent arguing that doesn't really have an end between the farmer, fear, the farmer and the developing country together feeling that the principle of IP protection is working against them and for the developed countries. There isn't really a direct solution to that, except through sovereign rights. And that's where the CBD has come. It's the only way farmers can protect their traditional varieties. It was enshrined in 1993 in the Convention on Biological Diversity. A lot of people think it only covers wildlife, pandas, whales, things like that. But actually it covers agricultural and domesticated diversity just as much as wild. It includes old varieties that aren't under protection and, and new crop varieties. Whether you've got IPR protection is not relevant, they're all covered by the CBD. And one of the nasty things about the CBD for us is that we require governmental level authorization and negotiation for any transfer of material. Imagine what that would do to the way we work with our collaborators if every time we wanted to work with something, we got to go through the Philippine government and the government where our collaborator works. It's recognized right from the beginning that CBD is much too restrictive for agriculture. And that's why we now have the treaty. The, tre the CBD actually requested the FAO to facilitate negotiation of the international treaty on plant and resources for food and agriculture. So the rules we have now are largely coming out of the CBD leading onto the treaty. So the new mantra is, is all about enforcing rights. We have to recognize that there are sovereign rights, there are IP rights. We need to take control of our IP, as we've been hearing many times from the DG and DDG. But as soon as we start want to take control of our IP, we have to take more care to meet our other obligations because we respect other people also have their own IP. And of course, comply with sovereign rights, including the protection of farmers' rights that their, their variety. And this was interesting, I must say, this last, last week, Bob said he couldn't even say in public what he felt like with when the, the big private companies, when he found the big private companies commercially using our license, our, our varieties for nothing. And I thought, this is great. This is Erie speaking the same tune as the traditional anti-Erie groups. A couple of years ago, I was speaking with some of them when we learned about these big companies using our varieties. And they got really mad, saying, why aren't you protecting your varieties? So if any of you is worried about the change in IP philosophy, the theory going from producing public goods to protecting IP, just think that this new approach to IP protection is exactly what the, the anti airy NGOs want us to do. They want us to take control of our IP so that we can prevent misuse by, by the big companies. And that means really now, what's really important is everyone has to be able to know and prove rights and obligations over every sample of rice in your country. Whenever you send it out, it's going to be screened for to, to check that you're allowed to be using it. So we now have some quite complicated rules for sending the seed outside period. The very first thing you have to do is ask yourself, why why are you wanting to send it? Here I put in four possible answers, which don't involve MTAs. You may want the recipient to do something for you. The recipient may want to grow it commercially. The recipient may be a farmer who wants to grow a, just to grow a crop non-commercial. Or the recipient wants their own variety back. None of these require MTAs. But they do require different things. If you want someone to do something for you, you've got to have a contract. 
Now, anyone wanting to build period varieties commercially has to do it with a license. They try to make things nice for collaboration with farmers. If you want to work with farmers, we're allowed just to give seed to a farmer without any more of a contract than the statement we may grow a crop with this variety, which is quite good. And if they want their own variety back, well, we acknowledge it's theirs, so we don't have any problem with them at all. If you're sending it out to allow others to do their own breeding, it's a little bit more complicated, depending on whether it's a gene bank accession or anything previously received with an SMTA or the other non iri line, this is the difficult one, different kinds of breeding lines or at least theory variety. They require different kinds of NTAs. The difficult one is, is this. If you've got non iri material and you didn't get with SMTA, it's going to be quite difficult to find out how you're allowed to give it to others if you want to give it to others. It's likely that you'll have to go and consult with the innovations management unit to check that we're allowed to do it. But apart from that, fortunately you really don't really need to know about these complexities because the system works it out. We have data on this in Iris. But isn't it? So I, I, I'm sure all of you have complied with previous DG memos to make sure that you've got all your germplasm documented together with its availability status in Iris. If you don't, you're going to have difficulty sharing with others through C Healthy. Because Iris is where CT Healthy will look for confirmation of how you're allowed to share the material. Working with farmers, I said we're allowed to give material to them easily. And that's fine as long as you don't take any, you've got no problem. If you want to take things from farmers, it gets a little bit more difficult. If you want to take germplasm from farmers, you've got to comply with national legislation on bioprospecting, and that's different in every country. What the CBD requires is government level, what they require, what they call the prior informed consent of pick. You've got to get the, the government to give their own consent before you do this, and it's got to be based on information you told them what you want to do it for. The Nagoya Protocol, which is a recent extension to the CBD, encourages you also get, to get picked from the farmer. And a, a lot of countries require this as part of the national legislation. The treaty tries to make things easy. It invites all farmers to share with SMTA. And, and treaty member countries are obliged to take, to take steps to encourage the farmers to share with SMTA. But that, these haven't really been awfully effective at the moment. It's still pretty difficult. If you want to get germplasm from a farmer, you'll need to make sure with the national authorities of the country that they're happy with you doing, you doing this. Taking traditional knowledge from farmers, the thing that SSD people do, is a lot more difficult. Well, uncertain. It's been the subject of pretty intensive discussion, uh, intergovernmental discussion for 20 years or more. I put in progress here because there doesn't seem to be much progress. They all say this is a really important thing to do. We have to protect farmers' uh, traditional knowledge, but no one seems to know what that means. So move on now on how to conserve that. This is another area where people tell us how to do things because they think it's really important. We can't be left to our own devices to do it properly. The standards were first defined officially by FAO and the PGR as it was in those days back in 1994. The revised standards have just been endorsed by the FAO in 2013, but these are all based on committee decisions. We haven't had much scientific input into them. So what we find is that they're not actually all that adequate. So one of the exciting things we've done over the past few years is to, to set up a, a new conservation research unit to address this problem, that actually we need to improve the standards. Here's an example of, of germination rates after a number of years, varying number of years of, of storage in the gene bank. And you see, of course, yeah, most of the germination rates are up here in the 80 to 100% range where they should be, but actually far too many uh, much lower germination rate than we would like. And we need to sort out why we're getting so much inadequate germination. One of the things we're finding is that 
the greatest with Jesus had any right on the first trial was processing. Here's an example where rice has been uh, held in temporary storage for either a short time or a long time before we can process it. Uh, we have to put it into the cold gym, into the cold store. And you see if it's undergone a long delay, then the germination rates, the survival under storage is, is much worse than if we process quickly. Sometimes we're forced into this, but because I mean, a lot of you want germplasm for us, we try to make that the priority. And if people want seeds urgently, then see things like seed processing get put to one side for a little while while we handle your requests. And that unfortunately has this knock-on effect of the, the remaining seed that survives with it. And there's genetic and environmental effects. Here are four varieties uh, being put through accelerated aging tests where we put them in, in strongly aging conditions for a short period of time. The black lines show uh, seed produced in the dry season, the red lines seed produced in the wet season, for four different varieties. We see for two deponica kinds, they're showing a very short lifetime compared with this house kind and this kind. So there's genetic variation, there's environmental variation, and somehow we, we need to sort out this quite complicated trait in order to maximize the, the longevity of the system. We need to scale up capacity because we're expecting much higher use of accessions, genetic stocks, particularly in, in the future. So we're looking at things like automating, automated here, for example, automated germination testing, which we are just looking into right now. Automated characterization that is getting grain length and width through image analysis. Um, which is almost there. Just, just like to highlight this. Notice that you can see the, the individual hairs there. Getting this kind of high resolution picture becomes really critical because then you can make the the, the computer distinguish the actual edge of, of the grain rather than see this as just a fuzzy boundary. So there's a whole lot of areas that we're hoping to improve efficiency which allows us to keep the machine in supply more effectively. Which leads on to the last bit of what I want to talk about. Is that the usage. Everyone says we need to use the collection better. Well, do we? Erie has, about 85% of our accessions have been screened by Erie scientists previous at one time or another, sometimes over 120 times. Last week, Bob said it was underused, only 5% were used in breeding, and that's true if you look at crosses. And I don't know whether you consider this a good attrition rate from 85% being evaluated to selecting 5% that are considered good enough for crosses. That might be appropriate, or you might show that what this is showing is that we're not able to choose the varieties better. We'd like to be able to give accessions to breeders that are more likely to fulfill their needs. But I would just like to highlight these gaps. If you're interested in, in testing some accessions that you've never tested before, we've got 16,000 old accessions that's never been evaluated since 1985. Things have changed since then. Maybe if they were evaluated again now, you would find them more interesting. There are 12,000 collections, uh, accessions that were collected after CPD that have not been evaluated, which is the majority of them. This is interesting because after the CBD, there, there was a concern amongst the breeders. Uh, a lot of the breeders decided they didn't want to use gene bank accessions because of the CBD, and that's reflected in this very high percentage of these post CBD accessions that are not being evaluated. Now that we've got the treaty in place, we might like to consider having a look at these things that the ones that looked at outside the NC. We've got a small percentage of post treaty accessions not evaluated, that should be not evaluated. Most of them have been evaluated. Uh, but they're starting to come into recently. But again, the new varieties that we have in the book. Here's the, just the origin of the old varieties that haven't been evaluated in, since 1985 from 90 different countries. Quite a lot from China. No one's looked at for 30 years. Just have a think if you'd like to try. These post-CBD accessions, 
a lot from Laos, not so many other countries, about 20 different countries, but still a range of the universities. One of the things that has been around in gene bank philosophy long, for a long time is that we need to characterize them, because that's what makes it useful. If you know what they're like, people will use it more. And, and we have put a lot of it, gone to a lot of effort in the gene bank to characterize it. And these are figures of a few years out of date, but we've got only over 95, over 90 percent characterized for, for most of the standard traits. But these tend to be highly heritable traits. We look down here that they're in the same order. But these are not particularly of agronomic interest to, to, to most breeders. If you come down here to days to 80 percent flowering, that's an important thing, which is up here. We have a lot of data for that. But an awful lot of this has turned out to be not of much interest to most users of the gene bank. So it hasn't been nearly as effective in promoting use of the gene bank as they used to say. The second thing we've been told time and time again is that we should publish our data online. So here you are, you've got a web database for you. You can, you can search it, you can choose it, you can choose what you want. And users ask us to do that, other gene bank organizers ask us to do that. But actually, when you look at the kinds of questions we want, we look, these are typical of real requests we've had. But as I was saying at Caltown, I told you, there's so many different variants of these, and you just ask us, well, the castle I won't know what to give you. You ask, as I say, I won't know what to give you, unless you tell us which particular one. Mice that's good for growing in Canada, or the UK, or Ethiopian highlands. Any, any of these things, drought, cheap blight, Climate change, I can't begin to tell you which are the best accessions for these ones. How would you convert these kinds of requests, things that readers want, into a database search? That's not a trivial exercise. I'm sure it would be worth doing, but we haven't yet found any online search mechanism for any gene bank in the world that actually translates what we know about accessions into what readers in the search and want. Another thing we've been pushed into doing is making core collections. There was a paper a long time ago that claimed that you could get 90% of the diversity into 10% of the collection, which is pretty much a figure pulled out of the air. Uh, they were saying that would give you a small enough collection to evaluate, but still people find that 10% is too big. 10% of our collection is about 12,000. You're not going to evaluate 12,000 accessions. So there are people who invented mini cores, micro cores, and nano cores. We, we have core collections over the whole range from 20 up, up to 12,000 accessions. You're welcome to use any one of them if you like. But why? I, I put down here, this is completely made up, a notion of theoretical frequency distri distribution for value for a defined objective when you're looking for a particular trait at a location on the production system. You're wanting to get maximum value. This is the frequency distribution of gene bank accessions. This, almost by definition, is what a breeder's collection should look like. Because the breeders have already gone through picking out the best. If, if we said, if we tried to argue that their collection wasn't better on average than ours, then the breeders wouldn't have been doing a good job. Moreover, they have tested it for their, for their purpose, and we haven't tested ours for our purpose. So why on earth should you waste resources on evaluating, like evaluating material that you know has a low average value. And the same question applies to a core collection, which is a small subset of a collection. What you really want is, is to get up at the, the, these valuable accessions that are better than anything the reader has. But how do you find that? You either need some very exploratory reader, or, or you need the gene bank to think of a different way of doing things. A lot of, or some of the breeders, some old breeders who are close to retirement will be much more cautious and say, I'm not going to bother screening all this useless material. Another strategy is, is to use GIS methods. If you know where uh, a, 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 a traditional address came from, you might be able to predict something about its properties something from high up in Nepal is getting more cold tolerant than something from the Tangus. So, so you can 
in theory, the news GIS approaches to make a better selection of accessions. But actually, when you look at what we've got, this is a percentage of accessions where we know data on, on, on these bits of passport data. So we know the country of origin from almost, almost everything. But still, even if you go down to the level of province, there's only half the collection of where we know the province it came from. And when you look for latitude and longitude, there's only about 14% of the collection of latitude and longitude collection with data. So applying GIS technologies is only going to work for a very small subset of the human collection. So it's not particularly effective in, in, in practice for most of the collection. Another one that gene banks have been told to do for many years is to get into pre-breeding, where we cross inferior accessions into elite germplasm to make them more attractive to breeders. Well, I'm, I'm thankful we don't have to do that because PBGB has been doing that very effectively for many years, bringing in new germplasm, especially for the purpose of, of making it easier to look other breeders. Next one is phenotype more. Everyone is saying we need to phenotype more. That's the big bottleneck. It is understanding the phenotype. But actually we can't do that with the whole collection. It's not even one trait. If you look at the difficulty of looking at the stress tolerance, you might have low heritability, you might need lots of replication, you might need lots of locations, you might need specialist equipment, unstressed and stress treatments. It's a huge task even for one trait. And no one would ever contemplate screening 120,000 positions. Right? If the specialists in those stress measurements can't do it, then we can do that. And it's very inefficient. If you're looking for code volumes, you're not going to start with, with, with accessions from sea level in the tropics. And more importantly, again, is the value of accession actually lies in the phenotype that's poisoning out of itself. But trying to think about what breeders can produce that's better than our accessions. It may be okay if you're looking for major genes, but the phenotype of an accession is a good, a good indicator of what its progeny might be, but it's really not a good predictor when you're looking at small effect GTLs and, and genes that have epistatic interactions. So it's not very really effective if you're looking for transgressive segregation, and that's what we need to be looking for. Right? Right wanting to invent new varieties that deal with new problems, we've got to have this transgressive situation. So we really have to phenotype the project. But if it's impossible just to phenotype the accessions, it's even more impossible to phenotype all possible projects. It's really out of the question. Which leads us nearly to the end get very quickly about the way we're thinking of doing things. If I went into this in, in proper detail, this would take another seminar in its own, and I hope Ken will do that one, one day before too long. The DNA has a very attractive characteristic for the gene bank, that it's 100% heritable, more or less. We can, in theory, measure it on all accessions, and that's what we need. To have an indicator of what an accession might be useful for, we must have data on it. If we don't have data on it, then we've got no idea what that accession is. And as you know, it's one determines the phenotype. So the, the idea now is, is that we develop the training set during the gene discovery by sequencing and phenotyping our core sets of between 20 and 3,000 accessions and their progeny using all sorts of methods, the magic, the, the nest association mapping population, the bivalent mapping population, the mutants, hopefully the, the C4 mutants, that they're trying to discover the function of every gene in the rice genome that will contribute to this knowledge of the relationship between genotype and phenotype. Once you have that for this core subset, you can start to begin saying, well, we can make a pre predictions about the potential value of the other accessions that we haven't phenotyped. And Bob last week was talking about theory 2035. This is what we envisage as theory 2035. We'll have all accessions for this. We won't have all accessions phenotype, we'll never have all accessions phenotype. But if we have this knowledge, we can then, we can divide our idiotype, like whether it's the new plant type or whatever the idiotype is of 2035, we can use this knowledge to convert that phenotypic idiotype in, into a sequence idiotype. 
and design that of the computer, and then compare that ideal sequence with what we have in the, in the gene bank, and we can construct the best breeding system, which accession will lead most efficiently to that, that new sequence that you designed, and we can use it to not only to choose the best of the parents, but also to design the best set of markers to, to use near marker assisted selection. <coughs> And we will only ever finish it to validate or refine the predictions. Of course, this will be cyclic. The first predictions aren't going to be very accurate. But as we build up the, the knowledge about the gene sequence relationship, we gradually get better and better and better. So we will always be, be phenotyping, but only guided phenotyping, not, not just phenotyping everything. Phenotyping in order to help us understand the relationship between gene sequence. The getting from there, get to there, is a big thing. It's, it's almost like saying, we can, you know, being the Scotty, it's that kind of thing. It's still way in the future. It's not going to happen until long after I've left the week. There's some very big data management and informatics issues required. We're going to have to come up with normal analyses of the gene to genotype relationship. We have already started putting genetic stocks in the gene bank. We, we think these are pretty key to helping build up this knowledge of gene to genotype. That the reference genome is a, is a big problem. The fact that we've only got little barrier at the moment, we need to be building up much better references that will uh, be useful across the entire horizon gene. But that's a very an important short-term target is to improve our references. Of course, sequencing technologies are going to improve, and we need to be exploiting those all the time. We're hopefully reducing the amount of assembly required to virtually nothing in, in the long term. We need, in the medium term, to optimize our pipelines for discovery of diversity. We're not going to just say, let's sequence the whole collection in one. We need to find out an efficient way to sequence how we do the first 6,000, then the first 10,000, the first 20,000, and so on. And optimizing the gene phenotype prediction system. Just what kind of algorithms do you need to get the predictions of the phenotype that, that allow us to use the collection? So that's it. I would like to acknowledge. The, the GRC team, everyone's in, involved in this, but not only the GRC, everyone else who contributes to theme one. Not only those who know we need to contribute to theme one, but there's a lot of people out there that are effectively part of theme one without knowing it. Anyone who's evaluating and using rice diversity is helping us get there. And even those who have a view on the political and legal stuff, they've, they've helped us through some tough times. So, thank you very much.